yeah, I probably should have. But if I'm honest, I'll add it out to here with health and safety this week. <laughs> What's up YouTube, my name's Quickie, welcome back to the channel. Um, good, the, the last video put the cat amongst the pigeons. <laughs> and all sorts of comments coming through. Um, which actually is a really good thing. Um, I thought it was really cool. Um, obviously some people liked it, some people didn't like it. And it was basically me trying to figure out how to use the Strinker Stretcher and what you could do with it and what you couldn't do with it and all that kind of stuff. Which is fine. Um, I'm new to it. I've never had one. I've never played about with one before. So, you know, it's a bit of a learning experience, really. And the reason why I put it all in, just so you know, is um, part and part, there's an awful lot of stuff on here that I haven't done before. I'm a welder fabricator by trade, but most of that is um, all these cabinets that are bent up by a CNC brake press. We get them, stick them in a jig, clamp it all down, weld it up and check it square. Um, and it's very kind of repetitive. With all this sort of stuff, with tube notching and blah, 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 you don't really get a chance to do it. And it's the same thing with the shrinker stretcher. Um, and anyone who's looking to get into a project like this, He's, he's going to walk the same path, basically. There's going to be stuff that you don't know. There's going to be stuff you're going to have to figure out. And uh, I thought it was worth putting it in and kind of showing you what I went through, trying to figure it all out, because anyone who's looking to get into this, he's, he's going to go down the same sort of route. And to be fair, it's as much a part and parcel as, as doing a bike build like this, as, um, you know, stripping it down, rewiring it, doing anything else to it really. It's all part and parcel of the project. So that's why I stuck it in. Um, I got a couple of thumbs down, which is fine. I don't care. I thought it was worth showing. I really did. But anyway, um, so done a load of research and stuff. Um, I am in the process of making a deep throat one. I haven't cut up Steve Rose one. That, that would just be wrong. But I am going to use the guts out of it and I'll just switch the guts from one to the other. Um, so I'll do that at some point. Actually, there's, there's a couple of tools that I'm going to do. Um, so I'm probably going to set up like a tool section, like a playlist or something. It won't be part of the Jixit project. It will be a separate play playlist and it will just be the stuff that I build for the workshop, sort of tooling and that sort of stuff. So I'll shove that up at some point. Um, once it's all done and we can have a play and you can see what it does and what the difference is. So that'd be cool. Something to look forward to. If it works. <laughs> well, you know, it is what it is. There was a whole load of comments that came through though about what I was doing wrong and how I could do it differently and mounting it differently in the vice. And the, the biggest overall thing was um, you really want an English world to do that. And you're perfectly right, and that's what I thought to start off with. But um, the shrinker stretcher is going to have its place on this build. You know, stuff like this bit here, I can just put a flange on either end, crank it, and I can get this nice little curve to it, rather than bending it around anything else. Um, so it is going to have its place. It is going to get used quite a lot. But to do the seat hump, I really do need an English wheel if I want to make it myself, which I do, and I'm going to. Um, but I have been looking at a couple of videos online of people that have got these and played about with them and these cheap little nasty, oh, they're not English wheels, the frame on them is tiny um, and it's just too much flex in them. So I'm probably going to build one as well. I'll buy the dies, you know, the, the anvil and the wheel um because they they do need to be absolutely cock on ground and just polished up and everything else so i'll buy a set of anvils but i'm thinking about making my own frame for it um and it ain't going to be out of this flimsy box section that you see on on some of these other channels an english wheel is supposed to be absolutely rigid i might even make it out of i-beam i haven't decided yet but that is 
tough as tough gets. I built a, um, a hydraulic um, roller tube bender and I did that out of I-beam, which isn't that expensive. Um, but if that's strong enough to hold up, you know, I mean, they stick them above like um, garage doors and stuff in houses as lintels. I mean, they are solid. So I might use one of them, or I might just get the chunkiest, thickest wool box section that I can get and use that. But but an English wheel is supposed to be rigid so that when you're rolling it, not only will it curve it to the shape of the lower anvil, but it will also curve it that way along the diameter of, of the wheels. But these little rubbishy ones, there's so much flex in them, it doesn't curve it that way. So it's not really that good. Um, if you want it just to curve in one direction, you're supposed to put like a rubber band around the top wheel. That cancels all that out. So then you're just working on the anvil shape, which is cool. I do like the idea of, of uh, making one and having to go see if we can't knock out the seat hump, this, this body panel up the back here. Um, that can wait, there's loads of other stuff to be getting on with. And at the end of the day, it's a body panel. The only thing that needs to marry up to it is the seat. And I can make that fit. So I don't really care if that's the very last thing that I do. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, happy with all this. This cardboard, I'm gonna use it as a template. That's what we're gonna be doing. Um, but today, what we need to do is, I, I need to, dress all this rear frame well, actually the whole of the frame out really because some of it is horrible um but i want all this dressed out and everything else and all the the welds sorted and ground down to how i want them to be before i go sticking all this under tray electrics tray and all this malarkey in reason being is that the way that i'm going to do it um i'm not going to be able to get in to the spade once it's in i'm not going to be able to get in there to grind it down so all that grinding and you know patching up the welding and all that sort of stuff needs to happen before i do the tray so that's what i'm doing um the tray yeah i'm gonna make myself something else as well <laughs> the trays are going to be inset this front one is obviously going to be um probably the more awkward one just because of the way it snugs in around here and everything. But what's going to happen is that the back one is going to be welded up to the inside of the frame. Then this one and this one, um, I'm going to basically fold them up, um, set them in, and then um, kind of slug weld them down the sides and stuff. So it'll be its own box with welded corners. Nothing's going to get in there and it'll be attached to the frame by weld so when you look up underneath it you'll see the frame tubes and then there'll be this box that's set into it nice gap all the way around and it'll be up maybe five mil from from the bottom edge of the tube um but that's how i'm going to do it this one exactly the same so it's going to be bent up as a box and stuck in here and welded in place with this little bit here inset for the battery just, I think it's going to look nicer when you look underneath it, but it's still going to be totally weatherproof and nothing's going to get in there. Um, so the thing that I'm going to be making to do that is a box pan break. Um, I've already got the steel on the way down. So when it gets here, I'll go through and I'll make one of them because it's just a handy thing to have, basically. Um, any boxes that I want to bend out, I can put a nice bend in it. And it's not just like a sheet metal break, which is one solid, think because it's hard doing corners you can't if you want to do all four corners on a box you can't really do it with one of them a box pan break is the same sort of thing but it's got adjustable blades on it which you can move apart so you can decide how big or how small you want the folding blade to be and it just makes this sort of stuff a lot easier and i'll have so many uses for that doing brackets and all sorts of stuff i'll just shove it in there and do it um want it to be able to bend i don't know up to about 1.52 mil in steel so it'd be, it'd be quite a chunky thing and i'll mount it on the end of the um the bench and stuff and it can basically just stay there it'll be a meter wide meter long depends which way you're looking at it but you get the idea so that's all to come so 
in order to sort all these welds and everything else out, I need to tear this lock down. What I want to happen is I want to take everything off of it so I've just got the frame. That way I can turn it whichever way up I want to, get the weld in there, get a good angle on it for grinding. So that means wheel, swing arm, forks, yokes, all that lot is coming off. So I've just got the main frame. So that's what we're doing. So it shouldn't take that long actually. Hopefully we don't find any more gremlins. Um, the other thing I want to do is fill in these panels because they just look stupid. On the, um, on the original bike, there was a plastic cover that went over this. And that's all it was, it was just a plastic cover. We ain't gonna need that. Um, he is talking about using an M unit blue. So we're not gonna need an ignition switch, and that's where I was gonna put the ignition. Um, there's another one of these on the other side, it's just that it doesn't have this hole. So this is gonna get plated over. We grind it all down so it's nice and smooth, and then he can decide maybe if he wants to stick a a badge on it with the bike's name or I don't know it'd do something with it I'm sure he's like that um, but yeah so that's what we're doing stripping this down so it's just the frame and then I can crack on with the rest of it happy days <laughs> Not so great. Can you hear that? A bit grunty, isn't it? Thing is, I would. Thing is, I would have thought that. Um, You're building a bike. He's obviously had the the wheels powder coated. Yeah, I mean they're lovely. There's nothing wrong with them. They just need a damn good clean. So, because he's powder coated it, he would have changed the wheel bearings. Um, It is a sealed bearing, it's got a sealed face on the outside. Um, there's no grease in there. I always, I know it's a sealed bearing, but I always tend to pack the gap between the bearing and the seal with, with grease anyway. Um, don't know why, I just always have to. I think, you know, it stops moisture and stuff like that getting in there. That one actually feels okay. And like this is the, the um, sealed bearing, so underneath this black cover is where all the, the bearings are. That one seems to me okay, it's just this side. Which is graunchy as hell. Oh well, something else to fix.
that's the linkage from underneath. Have you seen that? Right, so this bit attaches to the frame, this bit attaches to the frame. So those two points there. This is where the shock goes. And that's what gives you the range of motion. It doesn't actually move that much, but a little bit of motion at this end equates to quite a lot at the other end. Yeah, really simple design. Really simple. Um, ooh. Can you hear that? See, that's not grand, is it? There is a washer on the end here, so I'm presuming it's just done that to space it out. Because the inside of the frame was machined by his local machine shop to accept the Gixa rear end. Um, which is fine, which is fine, it's a good way to do it, however, all this spacing out and not putting a washer underneath this, that's a bit naughty. It's got these top hats, which um, essentially is shoved in here and there's just like a needle roller bearing in here. Anything we'll see. So it's actually been put together quite nicely. Um, there is a bit of nastiness going on in there though. And you can see the wear marks on this. Where the. Because this only moves, the, the swing arm pivot only moves a very small amount. And he's got needle roller bearings in here. And you can see, let me, uh, hang on. Give it a quick clean. Right, so he had these made up. But I don't know, can you see on there? If I rotate it, there's little lines up here and here. Um, nothing in the middle. Can you see that? I don't know. They do that, don't they? On the <laughs> whatever. Anyway, he's got one of these in each end. They're sitting on needle roller bearings. There's lots of brown goo and smoo and crap and muck and stuff in there, which is not amazing. And it did listen. See, that's not right. That is not right. And the edge of this, I wonder if that's what's, ah. Okay, so the edge of his bearing, um, the edge of the bearing here is, recessed in it's only like half a mil something like that but this top hat goes in the end and it's actually rubbing on the the edge of the swing arm so this hasn't been spaced properly um, essentially, this should be riding on the bearing. Because obviously as you do this up, you're just clamping the swing arm. And that is horrible, listen. Ooh. Right. We need to change that that is just going to wear out in no time. If, if he's only just put all this lot together 
and it's only just got 100 miles on it, so we said. And he changed these bearings at the time that he built the damn thing. They will wear out in no time. Yeah, not so good. Not so good. So we're just having a look for any damage or nastiness going on and stuff like that. Fork cells are fine, they weren't leaking or anything. Um, couple of little marks on the stanchions, but they're rubbing off, so that's fine. The fork legs themselves are pretty chewed up and scored up. And this happens where basically you get crap on the inside of the the yoke, like you know, burrs and stuff like that. So when you're shoving the fork up in it, you're twisting it to get it in because you haven't bothered to undo these enough. All those little but yeah, there's a couple there. Those little burrs scratch the crap out of your your fork legs. And of course they're going to go all the way through it, so you're going to see them. It's not like this is going to cover them up. Which is a real shame. Once you got it down to this stage, it is worth, in in my humble opinion, um, just having a real good look about, real good look on stuff. Um, with the race bikes in the past, every single weekend it used to get stripped down and cleaned, like religiously stripped down and cleaned. Um, and the reason being is that when you're cleaning your bike, you're looking at it and you're looking at it really quite closely. So if there's any cracks, or there's any dinks in anything, or there's any gouges or scuff marks or anything like that, you're gonna spot them. Um, so whilst we've got it down to its undies, we're gonna give it a damn good clean and have a look and see if we can spot anything that needs attention. Um, one of the frames that I had, um, uh, I crashed the bike. What was it I crashed? Oh, Capwell Park. That was it. That was in my first year of racing. Um, I crashed the bike there. Oh, yeah, yeah all right. It was reasonably quick. Um, but I rebuilt the bike. This was in my first first ever year of racing, so I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, but I rebuilt the bike. You know, no exhaust, all that other stuff, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then we was out racing two weeks later at Brands Hatch. And coming onto Clearways, which is a properly quick corner. It's all bouncing around and everything. This is on the Grand Prix circuit. 
bouncing around and everything it was and I ended up crashing there as well. And the reason being is that I'd, I'd actually damaged the frame because then we, we took it right down to the frame. We measured everything up and I mean, it was properly out of shape, properly out of shape. Um, and the front wheel was, was, was it, it twisted at the yoke, which on that frame is quite a thing. Um, that was a ZX6R. Um, and what I'd done, apparently, because we went to the motor line just to see if we could get it sorted. Um, and what I'd done in the crash at Cadwell Park is I'd actually cracked part of the frame. Um, and we didn't see it until the bike was right down to its undies. Um, and even then, it took the motor liner because he knew to check for stuff like this. He had a look and he spotted it. So, I would suggest there's a lesson to be learnt there. If you're gonna um, take a bike down to this sort of thing, because literally all we now have is the frame, that's it. Um, give it a good once over and check just everything. Because if there's something that does need attention, now's the time to do it, you know? You're never going to get a better chance to inspect everything. And it's also why you should clean your bike quite a lot, because when you're cleaning it, you're looking at it. You're looking at the bit that you're cleaning, and if you spot something wrong with it, well then you can fix it. But if you just put a grubby bike away and jump on it the next time you need it, how are you going to know? Do you know what I mean? Worth doing, I think. Right. And before anybody goes potty at me, doing the whole oh you should have been wearing safety glasses when you did that used an airline yeah i probably should have but if i'm honest i'll have it up to here with health and safety this week <laughs> bloody idiot at work where are they they are and um, we're shifting a load of sheet metal Bear in mind, these are the people that bought you, you've got to wear an air pack whilst you're welding. That I agree with. I think that, make, does, that does make good sense. However, I was shifting sheet metal, wearing gloves like this, when I should have been wearing gloves like this. Um, these have got basically leather on the palms. All the rest of it's exactly the same. It's just, it's got leather on the palms. Now, <laughs> what's a good word right I'm a welder we just get on with stuff if you've been in any fabrication shop or production welding environment or an engineering place of any description people just get on with it you get your head down you know what the job is you've got to do and you get it done if it's in the way you move it if it needs doing you do it there's no mucking about there's no one there looking for a job everybody is busy just all the time and that's, that's the way it should be I mean, you're being paid a wage you should you should graft for it in my humble opinion but anyway mr health and safety we're shifting a load of sheet metal work mr health and safety threw an epispastic flip because i was wearing these gloves and not them i didn't really think much of it but he proper threw a wobbly like meltdown well, after after we finished, probably had to go and have a little lie down, calm down or something. Bloke was a complete and total twit. And we went to the vending machine to get some of those gloves out. There wasn't any in the vending machine anyway. That was it, meltdown. His world had ended. Now, I'm quite happy to shift sheet metal with these. It's got like rubberized, so, you know, it's, it's, it's quite tough stuff. And all you're protecting yourself is against one of the sheets slipping and, and you know slicing your hand over that's all it is and these will do that fine but no wrong gloves 
So anyway, it kind of got me thinking about, yeah, and he's just been on my case all week because of this, like checking everything that I'm wearing. Is it the right PPE? Am I wearing my safety glasses in the correct manner? Am I happy with it? And do I understand the importance of all the health and safety stuff? Bugger off. I should invite him down to this workshop. He'd have a heart attack if he sees some of the stuff that goes on in here. But it got me thinking, right, all this health and safety is just, it's about um, acceptable risk, I think is the phrase he used. He did go on a bit, but I'm pretty sure I heard him say acceptable risk quite a lot of the time. So if you think about the angle grinder, I don't put a guard on it. That's my choice. I'm careful with it and I've never been bitten. Um, did I put my specs on when I was using the airline? No, I didn't. Because it's all going that way and I'm on it I'm over here. I'm quite happy to do that. That's my choice. But he's got this little book of words that he's got to follow. And he's going to make damn sure that everybody else is going to do it. And it can't be thinking. What if we didn't have the internal combustion engine? What if it hadn't been invented? But what we did have is the high vis wearing health and safety folks. Can you imagine somebody going, I've got a blinding idea, I've just invented the engine. It's awesome. Makes a shitload of power. It's brilliant. And we could we could we could build we could be build vehicles. We could stick the engine in. And that would help us get from A to B a lot quicker. Think of the loads we could move across the country with goods and everything else. We could do like, you know, stuff the steam locomotive, we'll have a diesel one. That would get there a lot quicker. And then we could have cars and bikes so every family could have one and they'd be mobile. They'd be able to go and visit their aunties and uncles in Brighton and all sorts of stuff. Take the dog for a walk. Which always struck me as a bit funny. Why would you put the dog in the car to take it for a walk? Anyway. Um, so yeah. Invented this engine. It's going to revolutionise the planet. And he's trying to sell the idea to the health and safety folks. And they go, oh, okay. So how did it work then? He says, well, very clever bit of engineering. Mostly made of metal, but there is some other stuff in there as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to put this highly combustible fuel into it. Honestly, you look at it with a match, it's going up in smoke. It's quite explosive stuff. <laughs> and we're going to set off thousands and thousands of controlled explosions within the engine. So boom, 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 boom. Thousands of times a second. Depends on the RPM, but you get the gist. And these things, they're going to be able to do stupid speeds. I mean, properly, bikes, 150, no worries. Cars, you have to pay a bit more to go that speed. But I'll quite happily do 70 miles an hour down the road. And like, we'll have special roads that only they can go on. And then we're gonna have right next to it a path that all the, all the people without cars can walk up and down. I mean, they're only gonna be a couple of feet apart, which is fine. And if the car doing 70 hits one of them, then he's definitely dead. And if he bashes it into a wall or something, then everybody in the car's dead. But we could give these to anybody. They just pass the test, it'll be fine. We're not gonna police it, we're not gonna limit their speed. We're just go, go as fast as you want. There are these speed restriction signs, but they're you know, they're they're more of a challenge than a limit. <laughs> and he's still trying to sell this to the health and safety bloke. This is what happens when it runs out of fuel then. But well, see that's gonna be the really clever bit. We'll set up a whole industry and we're gonna have these, these shops. We we'll call them garages. And they're gonna be millions of the buggers. And they're gonna store just tens of thousands of gallons of this highly combustible fuel right underneath the ground where people are walking across it. But to fill them up, we're going to have to have these massive tanker trucks that deliver the fuel to the garages. <laughs> Can you imagine this poor fella trying to sell the idea of that to the health and safety folks?
Anybody can have one. Yeah. No age restriction. Well, you know. I think it would be stupid to give them one until they're at least 16, because they're dead sensible by the time they get to that age. <laughs> God, health and safety, they just wreck everything. What is the point? So yeah, I've had it up to here with health and safety this week. I think they're stupid. Well, no, I don't think they're stupid. I think they are necessary, because obviously there's you got to protect the workforce and you've got to protect the company about being sued if there's an accident and all this kind of stuff. But if somebody said, go and stick your head in the oven, and turn it on and keep it there, would you? No. If they said, stand in the way of a chop saw or, you know, I don't know, go and pick daisies off the firing range, would you? No, of course you wouldn't. But that's sort of down to you to make that judgment call, isn't it? Isn't it? Honestly, if, if we didn't have the internal combustion engine now, and somebody just invented it, they would never get it passed. So, you know, I mean, they're still quite dangerous things when you think about it. The speeds that these things can do and the damage they can cause in the wrong hands. But yeah. So, health and safety will not be getting a Christmas card off me this year because the blokes are plum. <laughs> <laughs> so, here is the game plan. Um, got the frame all down to literally just a frame, as you can see. Um, so, what we're going to do now is I'll set the welding desk up over there, and this is over here. Okay, and that's a good reason actually. Um, what I need to do is on the frame, if you look at some of these little bits here, can you see that in the corner, there's a little line, the same across here. What I want to do is to get some more weld into here, so I've got more material in there that I can then grind back and dress it all up so all these transitions are nice and smooth, because I want it as a seamless finish. Um, if you look at this part of the frame this is obviously where we joined the tubes so here you can see where I've got the town on it I've got it nice and smooth here there's a little bit of a line there which needs to be filled up so that's what we're going to be doing the weld is way over there partly because it's like high voltage electricity and whenever you're grinding all the dust and everything else that comes off of it is basically iron fine you know it's it's fragments of metal do i really want to be chucking like metal dust all over my welding equipment uh, probably not um we've had a few incidents at work where people have been grinding next to stuff that they shouldn't have been grinding and basically it's failed um you get a build up of dust in stuff it causes a shirt thing goes kaflooey and work stops which does not keep the boss very happy um, so basically over here we're going to be doing the grinding I can just pick the, the frame up because it doesn't weigh hardly anything really take it over there and weld the bits that I need to weld and once it's cooled down bring it back here and I can grind it and that way I try and keep the two things separate um, the welding desk is over by the door purely because of this you know this carcinogenic thing I was talking about the other day well there's a bit more of a draft by the door. It does mean that if the wind really picks up, it could blow the gas off the weld, then you start getting porosity and stuff like that. But I've been welding over there today anyway, and it's fine, it's not a problem. It just, I like to try and keep the two things completely separate. That's all. Um, I'm not gonna bore you to tears with this, because it's just gonna involve an awful lot of marching between here and over there, and then back again, and then back over there again. And then over here to do a bit more grind, you get the gist. It's just going to be really repetitive and I don't want it to be painful. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the next step. Um, so I'm going to call it there for the day, I think. Um, you don't need to see this bit. You've seen it all before. So there you go. <laughs> that's the plan. Anyway, I'm glad I got it down to a frame though. Because, I mean, this is it's one solid piece. No moving parts to it. It's just a frame. 
which is kind of cool. Um, the frame that they welded is horrible. I oh, mean, the welds on it are shocking. I know it's a breakaway frame, and I could dress it all down, but you don't know what the wall thickness is of any of this stuff without cutting through it. I ain't about to do that. However much I want, I hate breakaway frames. They're just horrid, nasty things. But anyway, that's what we've got to work with. So, uh, next few days I'm going to be doing welding and grinding, like I said, welding, grinding, welding, grinding, and I'm going to get all this lot dressed up. So it looks like just one seamless piece. There's no joins, there's no bit sticking out, there's, no, there's none of that. Um, I'm going to plate the sides of the frame as well to get rid of those. I don't know what the bloody hell that's for. I really don't. It doesn't make any sense. But that's going anyway. Um, so we'll get all the sides dressed down, all ground down, and it'll look lovely. Um, I've got loads of different things to do it as well. Just to... I ain't going to show you all the grinding. It's going to be boring as hell. You ain't going to want to see that. However, uh, I did get another one of these. Um, when we was up in the Shed of Dreams, um... And I think I'll cut these videos as well. Anyway, Craig pointed me in this direction. So it's like a, it's a soft black plastic backing and, and you get these, you get different grits of paper that you can stick on the front. And it goes on your angle grinder. I did have one, it was in the other one, and I turned it on and the thing just exploded. That was a brown trouser moment, I can tell you. I did have my safety specs on. Not that it would have done anything, because this, Boom, like that. So anyway, we're gonna give that a go. And this is gonna be for more, you know, removal of lots of material quickly, basically. So don't go that way on the tubes, go that way on the tubes. It's a bit more cack handy, but it just means you don't put loads of flats into the tubes and you, you keep the shape of it. So we're gonna be using that. I've got various grits of paper. We'll see how we go with that one. Uh, one thing he did suggest is one of these finger sanders, and I happen to have one. That's handy, isn't it? Um, apparently what he does quite a bit is, if you if you look, can, can you see in, in no, you can't, can you see? I don't know. Let me show you. If you take the belt off. See on one side, it's got that pad there, right? On the other side, it hasn't. The pad on this is, is really old and knackered and there's not a lot of pad left <laughs> so anyway what that does is the the gap between the paper and the pad is a lot less than the side that hasn't got it so this paper deflects an awful lot more this belt deflects more on this side than it does on that side which is quite good if you're getting into little tight spaces but it's you still want to have a little bit of a curve to it and you know the obviously the closer you get to the the wheel on the end yeah it sort of firms up on the angle changes and stuff so anyway um he apparently swears by one of these things so i'm going to be giving that a go as well um the other thing i've got is trusty da sander can you see that da sander it is a hoofing big one i know but it's also quite good um runs on compressed air and you can change the speed of it and all this kind of stuff i have got one of these interference pads on it can you see so ordinarily you just get the orange bit and your paper goes straight onto that orange bit. That's Velcro on the back of it. But you can also get these little squidgy pads that go in the middle and it just makes it a bit more sort of compliant. So getting round curves and all that sort of thing, instead of pushing it up against a hard sanding surface, I suppose, it's a little bit more compliant and you can stand a better chance of keeping the shape. This one does do rotary and random but apparently you have to stop tool before changing sanding action. Sounds important. I'll have to try that one time, see what happens. <laughs> so anyway, what it means is, but just on rotary, it does spin, and that's the only action that you get. The really cool thing about the random thing is, as well as the spinny action, this whole bit on the front oscillates randomly as well, and you end up with loads of little squiggles. Um, and obviously the coarser the paper the deeper the squiggle sort of thing but with, with like sanding anything you don't just go in one direction you're supposed to go in multiple directions like that 
because you remove more material and, and it's kept as a constant sort of thing so you get a better finish at the end of the day and it's a more effective way of doing it i've also got um i've got a little dremel which has got all sorts of attachments on it um including some little die grinding bits that i found which is, it does do quite a good job and i've got the the die grinder for the compressor and stuff as well so that's all the stuff that we're going to be using i'm not going to show it yet you will get bored stupid it will be painful <laughs> but yeah you don't need to see that bit um so what i've got coming next is a load of steel coming because i'm going to make myself a box pan break so normal sheet metal breaks is, is just used for putting a you know a bend in a piece of sheet steel basically or sheet alley or whatever it is cool thing about a box pan break is that you 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 don't have just that one solid blade it's made up of lots of blades that bolt onto the main blade and you can choose how many and therefore how long you want the blade to be so if you're only doing a little box but you want to bend all four corners up all four edges up you can do it with a box pan break because you can put a smaller blade in bend those two ends and a slightly longer blade and bend the other two ends and it'll all come up to nice corners whereas if you've got a fixed length of blade and you're only doing a little box it's you know get to your third bend and it starts becoming interesting and then you end up doing stuff like shoving a bit of wood in there just to make up the gap and it, it doesn't bend the same so i'm just going to go ahead and make one i was looking online how expensive are they? I mean, like hundreds of quid for a decent one. The one I'm making is a metre long. For a metre long, you're probably talking 250, 300 quid for a box pan break. Unbelievable. You pay that for some of the normal sheet metal breaks as well. Ridiculous amount of money. And they look really simple, so I'm just going to make one. Um, so, I've ordered 60 quid worth of metal. 60 quid compared to however much and I'm just going to make one um, I'm going to once it's done it will live at the end of the bench it will just stay there it's a metre long I ain't going to need to bend anything more than a metre bloody hell so yeah that'll be the next one um, where I'm making these tools like where I'm making the the, the deep throat shrinker stretcher I'm halfway through that actually I'm, I'm I'll recall this, but basically I'm going to set up a separate playlist it's not part and parcel of this project it's just tools that I need in order to do these projects and there's going to be quite a few of them so I'll set up a separate playlist and show you how I make some of this stuff um, it's pretty simple and straightforward really it's just it's, it's time consuming and it's not part of this build technically so it'll be in a different playlist but that will follow um, so that's my week sorted then. Um, Steve-O is going to be back, I think. Uh, he's going to be back next weekend. I think he, he comes back off his holidays tomorrow, I think. I don't know, I could be wrong. He'll text me later on. Um, so we'll probably see him next week. And all this will be done. And maybe the box pan break will be sorted. So then we can start bending stuff up and get it mounted. I don't know, we just have to see how far we go. So anyway back on wide on an angle next week and um should be a laugh should be good um thank you very much to everyone who subscribed i know i'll say it every time but I'll, it is also I, I, we're creeping up on 1500 subs now which is really cool and we're getting more and more comments and the comments are gold the comments are brilliant even even if you know maybe they're not as positive as i would like you learn from it and especially with the last video and stuff, there's loads of people chipping in helpful comments as well as the, oh, you're doing really well and it looks great and all that kind of stuff, which is great. But the ones where people are now offering a bit of advice and an alternate way of doing stuff, I quite like that. So that is good. That is good. So keep them coming. I'll, I'll read every one. And at the minute, because we ain't got that many subs, I can answer all of them as well. So you will get a reply. Um, I'm thinking about setting up a Facebook page as well just oh, I don't know well there you go let me know in the comments do you want me to set up a Facebook page if you do then I'll get it done um, and I'm loving all this stuff as well we're back on Andy's t-shirt today um, I think t-shirts are a brilliant 
thing for these channels to do. Cause, you know, it shows them a bit of love. They get something out of it. I don't, I don't know how much they I, to, I need to look into that, actually. I think he uses Teespring. Is it Teespring? Or is it awesome? Te I don't know. I'll Google it. Where's my phone? Where is my phone? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I might, I might set up some T-shirt things. I don't know. I'd have to have a think about what needs to go on it. So again, if you've got any ideas, you know, stick it in, stick, stick it in the comments. I quite like these ones because it's got funny slogans on the back of it as well. And I'm full of funny slogans. I could do something quite good with that, I think. But anyway, let me know what you think. Um, if you're new to the channel, I hope you like what you see. Do please consider subscribing um, and joining the party and see where we go. Um, we're not just doing this build there's going to be loads of them following this one, hopefully. Um, and uh, do the little bell thing, and that will tell you when I've uploaded another one. You can go and check it out. And it's all sweet. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for joining me again, and I hope to see you next time. Laters.